Welcome back to The Breakfast. And now we, of course, will go straight into telling you things that happened today in history, the 22nd of March, many years ago. I'm going back to the year 1961. And uh, the, the, our conversation this morning is about one of Ghana's most popular leaders, Kwame Nkrumah. It was on this day that he called on world leaders and the United Nations and everybody who was, uh, you know, in position at that time to place sanctions on South Africa uh, because of their appetite rule at that time. Uh, there is a, a long, uh, not, maybe not very long, but, you know, over the years there was a long history of uh, racial segregation in South Africa that led to the death of many, many um, black uh, South Africans. And I'll quickly share you know, with you where all of this started from. Um, the racial segregation and white supremacy had become central uh, aspects of South African policy long even before apartheid began. The controversial 1913 Land Act passed three years after South Africa gained its independence marked the beginning of uh, territorial segregation by forcing black Africans to live in reserves and making it illegal for them to work as sharecroppers. Uh, by 1950, the government had banned marriages between whites and people of other races and prohibited sexual relations between black and white South Africans. It is uh, rather in one of the most devastating aspects of apartheid, the government forcibly also removed black South Africans from rural areas designated as white to the homelands and of course sold their land at low prices to white farmers. From 1961 to 1994, more than 3.5 million people were forcibly removed from their homes. And then there was uh, an incident that happened in nine, that took place in 1960 at the black township of uh, Sharpsville. Police opened fire on a group of unarmed blacks associated with the Pan-African Congress uh, that, of course, uh, led to the death of about 67 blacks and more than 180 wounded. And so it was, of course, you know, reactions to all of this that had uh, happened, of course, uh, including the incident in 1960 that the Ghanaian president back then, Kwame Nkrumah, called on world leaders uh, to impose sanctions on South Africa. Uh, the African, at that time, South African uh, harbors were all closed. Uh, uh, South African aircraft were prohibited from flying over the rest of the continent. And as the first black-led sub-Saharan states to emerge from the colonial rule, the independence of Ghana also was um, pretty strong back then. And uh, Kwame Nkrumah had some you know, authority you know, across the African continent to do what he did at that time. Um, mm -hmm. Where, you know, of course, we'll continue to talk about these things and we would celebrate eventually in the late, uh, early 90s the emergence of uh, Nelson Mandela, who, along with uh, uh, President de Klerk, I, I can't remember his full name now, um, you know, was one of the people who ensured that apartheid was kicked away and there were more rights and, uh, and there was more freedom of black people in South Africa. To date, unfortunately, in 2021, you would still see stories, you would still see, uh, still hear, you know, short stories of racial segregation in South Africa to date. But mm -hmm. um, I, you would definitely agree that a lot of progress has been made and a lot of things have changed from the 60s and 50s to where we are today. Wow. Kwame Nkrumah. I remember studying about him in school, international studies and diplomacy, learning all about his pan-Africanist ideals, how he basically strived for a united Africa. He was the first president of Ghana, and his legacy really lives on. Look, now we're talking about how he took action against the appetite policies of, you know, South Africa. Back then, he said, quote, now that South Africa has decided to continue her apartheid system and has elected to withdraw from the Commonwealth, it is incumbent on all members of the Commonwealth and the duty of all nations in the world to bring pressure to bear on South Africa to abandon apartheid by imposing total economic and political sanctions on her. Good to know that that was felt in the ways that it did yes. and the ways that it was felt at that time because we saw how everything turned around. Even after all the travails of Nelson Mandela, he came out victorious, you know, won that election, and we began to see it change gradually in South Africa. And it's such a shame when you look back at the history of South Africa, how this whole appetite system began because we know that a group of explorers, you know, they had a shipwreck at Table Bay Mountain in South Africa and they saw that, oh, this place, the weather is fantastic, similar to where we're coming from in other parts of the world. And they stayed there and began to, you know, colonize the people. 
the people of uh, uh, the, 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 the Bushmen, there was these, these Zulu people. There's so many native tribes that they fought against. They basically took over their land and began you know, their policy of colonialism, turned around now to the people who gave them shelter basically from that storm, like I mentioned, and began to impose a policy of colonization. But great thing is that you know, Nelson Mandela you know, succeeded, like I said, eventually, and we're seeing that there's more unity, more peace in the African continent, even though we still have xenophobic attacks here and there, but yes. we're, we're a lot better than we used to be, thanks to people like Kwame Nkrumah, who stood up and said, we will not tolerate uh, apartheid, we will not tolerate racial discrimination, yeah. and uh, we have the world as we have it today, yeah. due to the um, legacies of people like this. So you... you um you would still see some of you know these um, colonialist you know moves you know not just in South Africa now but you know it, it's happened in many places even in the United States you know people would always argue that the Native Americans you know are the true Americans and um, um, you know they they basically were, were kicked out of their land to you know let the well Americans of today uh, take over that place there is till date mm -hmm. still evidence of white supremacy, not just in the United States, but also in Africa here. I'm, not sure, I'm sure you must have seen the video of um, a white man, I'm not sure what country it was from, who um, had a black man pulling him on a trolley. You know, then they had, they had to, it, would, it, it was sometime last week, a video um, uh, was released yeah. um, of um, two, two black men who had seen it happen and then had, you know, come, you know, rather step forward and ordered him to come down from the trolley and asked the, you know, the, uh, the black man to stop doing that. You know, so he basically was using him as his, well, best way to put it, a slave. Mm -hmm. um, so you would sti still see those things happening in, in our world today, simply because there's people who feel superiority because of their skin color and because of their race. Um, and of course, there was, there was, there was, there's always going to be uh, a narrative that will, you know, that they use, you know, to, um, to push that, um, you know, those things to continue to happen in our world today. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done here in Africa for us as a continent and for black, you know, uh, people to be able to get themselves to a place where they feel entirely, um, 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 you know, I don't, not necessarily superior, but, you know, they understand the values that they have. They understand that this is their land and they understand that nobody should be able to put them down because they're black. Do you um, think we can ever achieve a world peace? World where peace. there's world peace, world unity among all races. Nobody's, there's nothing like discrimination anymore. Even though people I don't say think, that's I don't think utopia. It's possible. But do you think that's possible? I don't possible? think it's possible. You know, because even among black people, there's discrimination. There's discrimination in between um, African Americans and um, you know, people who, you know, Nigerians and the likes who live in, in the U.S. Immigrants. Uh, so, so, yeah, immigrants, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's almost, I don't think it's ever going to completely go away. Hmm. We'll talk about the U all Muslims, you know, every now and then in the news, talked about, you know, what happened uh, in Miami before um, um, uh, the coup, you know, uh, in February. Um, there was, of course, you know, ethnic cleansing. There was, there's so much that goes on in the world today that is simply just because of some people feeling superior to the other, even in the, Su the Sunni Shiite uh, battle that we hear about here in Nigeria and, of course, um, in other parts of the world. So there is, it's, it's maybe human nature, you know, that we would always, some people would always want to feel superior to the others simply because they don't agree with their way of life or because of their color, the color of their skin or because of their sexual orientation. There's always going to be um, all of that. We can't, I don't think we can rule it out of the world. It's human nature. Animals might be, you know, might be better you know, in, in that regard. Uh, but no, it, we, we wouldn't be able to t completely take it out of our world. Okay, so away from history, no, it's actually still, still talking history, basically. It's today in history. history. But we're looking, <laughs> uh, you know, at uh, religion, basically. We know about, you know, if you studied, you know, religion, for people who study religion in school, or if you're a Christian, or whatever religion, basically, the death of Jesus Christ is a very famous story and uh, about how it was put in the tomb and uh, all of that. So today in history, March 22nd, 2017, the tomb of Jesus had been restored and it reopened 
in Jerusalem. Now, thousands of Christian pilgrims, members of the clergy, they gathered at a modern shrine in Jerusalem's old city to celebrate the completion of a month long effort. You know, hundred years, hundreds of years in the making, the restoration and repair of Jesus' tomb. Now, the shrine was in danger of collapse, and you know, it had been propped up by an unslightly iron cage since the 19th century, and uh, the edifice is now one of the faith's holiest sites. The tomb of Jesus Christ had been worn down by centuries of water damage, fire, smoke, humidity, bird droppings, human visitors, disputes among feuding denominations who shared control of the church, yeah, you know, and they, they had been unable to agree on plans to fix the shrine. You know, but they eventually agreed and uh, they did restoration or rehabilitation work on the shrine, the tomb where Jesus was buried, and it cost over $3 million. Some of the sources will tell you this cost about $4 million, but this financing came mostly from a donation from the World Monuments Fund. Other funding came from you know, three denominations, a personal donation from King Abdullah II of Jordan, and uh, the chamber thought to be where Jesus' body was placed after crucifixion. It was a project that was carried out by a group of about 50 specialists. And uh, the, the site now is visited by people all over the world. You know, just the way you have the, the pilgrim to Mecca, you have Christian pilgrims visiting these sites in Jerusalem to, you know, basically see the tomb where Jesus was laid, restored after many, many years. Well, so <laughs> this, you know, is something that happened thousands of years ago. Um, you know, any person who, you know, has read the Bible or has, you know, heard Christian uh, teachings and uh, history would always want still question, like, how do they no, know that that was Jesus' that that was right? exactly the spot? You know, there's people who also claim that they know where, um, you know, Lot's wife had turned to salt and that, you know, that pillar is still like in existence someplace in the world. Uh, you know, there's also those who would say that Noah's Ark, you know, is still in some place, you know, on, on, on the, in the world and you might still see it in some place. But how do we know? It I is? guess, I guess that's why we have specialists, people who are excavators, who are historical yes. excavators. I, you know, you watch documentaries about things like this and they go and excavate the pool of you know, cavemen and say, when they do the analysis, this, this is all scientific. They tell you this pool is 7,000 years old. They analyze it and they tell you what earliest people, people of the earlier times, you know, their diets, what they must have eaten. And they begin to give all this analysis. It's totally scientific. Lots of people might disagree, but really I believe that this, this things work. But away from this, really, I, I think to myself sometimes, you know, the, um, what's it called now? The Garden of Eden. Where's the Garden of Eden? It's right someplace. Now? Where is it? I'm Where's... sure, it, I'm sure it, it still you know, can be found. What, what country would that, would that be in, really? It's... I'm really interested. If you know, please let me know. It's and that's a Felix up. Twitter me. I am really interested. <laughs> I'm really interested way. in history, really. So <laughs> if, if we have a group of scientists who came together, they did their research, they did their findings, and they say that was Jesus' tomb. Who are we to disagree? Except you have contrary evidence. You know, but it's also Maybe the same way people, you. people would, you know, Prophets disagree with the way, you know, the looks of Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's a particular face that has been approved as the official face of Jesus Christ. You know, but um, how are we sure that's you know what it looked like? And there's a lot of people who don't agree. Sure. Anyway, we've talked about issues uh, today. One of which is World Water Day. And just a reminder before we wrap up, World Water Day is about what water means to people, its true value, and how we can better protect this vital resource. The theme of World Water Day for 2021 is value in water. And the value of water is about much more than its price. Water has enormous and complex value for our households, food, culture, health, education, economics, and the integrity of our natural environment. SDG 6, as uh, Social Development Goals, is to ensure water and sanitation for all. World Water Day will be celebrated online for the first time. And of course, uh, our body, if you, you know, went uh, through that part of uh, school and learned science, our body contains 70% water. Other than being a basic need for our body for, uh, for survival, water also means different things to different people. The importance of water has been highlighted 
in this pandemic, where frequent hand washing is one of the health protocols for preventing the spread of the virus. And it's a quick reminder to everyone that it doesn't end after the pandemic. Um, you should still continue to wash your hands. To farmers, water is everything. Irrigation is life. Agriculture accounts for roughly 70% of global water use. And of course, um, from what we've seen from our research, water is a dwindling resource. The widespread water quality degradation across the world is the most serious water problem, threatening human health and ecosystems' integrity. Earlier on the program, we spoke about Lake Chad and how 90% of it seemed to be um, depreciating. Water scarcity and water quality degradation present major challenges in securing, uh, securing enough water for good quality, or uh, rather of good quality, to meet our needs. And of course, uh, here in Nigeria also. And that's where we will be wrapping things up this morning on The Breakfast. Thank you very much for starting up the week with us, and we hope that you have a very, very interesting week ahead. Yes. Have a great day, and it's bye from us.